Hi, I'm Sien Xiao. And I'm Sammy Winemaker. We talk to people who have information and tips on how to unlock a better illness experience. The waiting room revolution starts right now. Hi, everyone. Before we start, I should explain that our guest today is from Stanford in Palo Alto, California. It's a sunny day there, and he's in a coffee shop. So we're going to do our best to reduce the background noise, but you might hear some coffee baristas working in the background. Let's get started. All right, welcome back to the Waiting Room Revolution. I'm very excited to have my friend and colleague here, Dr. Carl Lorenz. He is a general internal medicine and palliative care physician from Stanford University. He is also the section chief of the Veterans Affairs Palo Alto Stanford Palliative Care Program. He's an accomplished palliative care researcher and a leader at the national and international levels. So we're very excited to have you on our show today. Thank you. That's uh, very kind, Sien, and it's a pleasure to be here. Welcome, Carl. Thanks, Sammy. So, Carl, I'd love to hear more about your origin story. Was there a moment or a patient that made you want to pursue a career in palliative medicine? Thanks uh, for asking, Sien. Um, as a matter of fact, there were several patients um, that, as clinicians, um, you know, they just tend to stick in our minds, right? Stick in our hearts. And I remember when I was in training, I had a patient, I think I was a chief resident at the time, and one of our pulmonologists, a very respected and capable clinician, came to me and I think said the kind of thing that was common at the time, which was, you know, Carl, this is a, a patient, um, we really don't have anything else to offer uh, him. Um, he had stage four non-small cell lung cancer. Um, and so, you know, I'm going to give him to you. And so as a, as a chief, and working in general internal medicine, the patient came to me. And I remember um, the first time that I met him, he was in excruciating pain. Um, I remember trying opioids and not really knowing how to titrate them and not really knowing or understanding um, the range of side effects and how to um, communicate with a patient about them and mitigate them. And I just remember the last time I saw him, he was still in pain. I really hadn't been able to accomplish my goal of making him uh, of relieving his pain. And, um, and I remember the sense of hurt and, um, and angst that he and his wife communicated uh, in their faces. Um, that made me feel like a failure. I had another such case uh, the following year, um, a patient who had colorectal cancer. And before his cancer, he and his wife um, had the, uh, the presence of mind to speak to me proactively. Um, I, I was uh, not attuned to ask. But they spoke to me proactively and indicated that um, the one wish they had for their lives, for his life as he got older, was not to die in an intensive care unit. And I took a vacation of a week or 10 days. I remember coming back from the vacation. Um, he, he had developed colorectal cancer in the interim, and, and he wound up uh, in our hospital in the kind of medical cascade that's so common, um, but requires proactive planning to avoid and, and he, in fact, died in our intensive care unit. And in both of those cases, I felt a deep sense of failure um, as a clinician. But when I was in a, uh, then two or three years later, I was in a research training fellowship at UCLA. And at the time, uh, Joanne Lin was uh, first walking around to kind of share the results of the support trial. It was 1998 and 99. And she was sharing the results of that trial um, one of uh, the institutions was UCLA, where I was at, and she came and told us, I remember the big message being, end-of-life care is really bad. And those, uh, those uh, clinical incidents, those, that sense of personal failure as a clinician, I realized um, instead of being personal failures, we're really paradigmatic of the healthcare system. And, and I uh, realized uh, for myself with one life to give um, that it was something that came at tremendous cost to people, um, physical, emotional, financial, um, that it was um, an issue that there was uh, almost complete inattention to uh, among my peers. And I thought it was a worthwhile way to spend the few decades of life I might have um, uh, working on something to make, uh, to make life better for patients and families. 
Okay. Do, do tell, Carl. Don't leave us hanging. What'd you do? <laughs> After the talk from Joanne? <laughs> yeah. You said you were going to spend decades making life better for, for, yeah. for people. So do tell. Well, the first thing I did um, is I started scouring uh, my environment to think about a way that I could tackle this problem. As it uh, turned out, one of the resources I became familiar with was the California Office of Statewide Health Planning and Development and our hospice data set. So um, some of the very first questions that I addressed had to do with um, hospice care and how it was provided, and in particular, how profit status affects the way um, that hospices uh, offer services, um, the diversity uh, of patients that they serve, including among the uninsured, and, um, and also uh, their restrictions on care on the basis of um, decisions patients make about, uh, about uh, curative care or the potential overlap with uh, curative or disease-focused care. So that was the first target, and it kind of it got me started. Um, and you know, from there, I've uh, I've done a number of things. I've focused on uh, developing quality measures, um, uh, both for uh, for hospice care. Um, I've worked uh, I worked on the minimum data set, one of the iterations of the minimum data set. Um, I developed quality measures for cancer and non-cancer care um, and palliative and end-of-life care. And, and I continue to focus on that area today. I also um, wound up focusing uh, part of my career on symptom management and symptom measures and uh, with a particular focus on pain, um, which I also continue, uh, continue to do. And then over time, uh, if I branched out at all, I would say it's more in the area of implementation and quality improvement. Um, I've had the opportunity to uh, run a center uh, called the Quality Improvement Resource Center for the Department of Veterans Affairs. And, um, and it is a privilege uh, to do that. And um, in doing so, I get to contribute to the stream of innovation that has characterized uh, the VA's efforts um, in this area to care for aging, uh, frail, um, and uh, really quite sick veterans um, in the later part of their life. Carl, you talked about working in the Department of Veterans Affairs, or the VA in the U.S. I wanted to understand more about providing palliative care for veterans. Um, I'm going to address uh, your question maybe broadly about um, care for veterans. And I, I think there, um, I'm a veteran myself, actually, and as you know, uh, well, maybe you don't know, but I, I am a I am a, a veteran myself. I was in the United States Navy for seven years, and I remember both during the time uh, I was in the military, and you know afterwards there are a number of striking characteristics of veterans. Um, you know, one of course is just sort of epidemiologically, veterans are sicker than the general population. Um, uh, veterans uh, are very diverse because for years they've been drawn from the entire United States population. And so um, they're, uh, they're very diverse, both uh, racially and ethnically and also socioeconomically. And the experiences of veterans are quite particular and come to, come to bear on the way that people experience end of life. I think in, um, besides the um, profound disabilities that veterans live with because of the emotional vulnerabilities that they have and the prevalence of those both um, emotional disorders, psychiatric disorders, including substance misuse, um, they come to the end of life uh, sometimes with lives that have been quite fractured um, previously. And that affects the quality of the relationships and caregiving that they have access to. Um, uh, experiences of violence, I think, uh, are a uh, particular concern and often have leave scars and a legacy of, uh, of anxiety, a legacy of um, guilt um, and uh, the sense that things aren't right. So um, it's, uh, it's challenging to provide care to veterans. At the other, on the other side of that though, it's a remarkable privilege because I think the VA as a system um, has provided a, an approach to comprehensive care that uh, typifies too few elements of our healthcare system. 
And so um, many times uh, we have more of the resources that we really need to mitigate those challenges. Are there challenges in terms of caring for veterans um, similar to uh, other patient populations in the sense that their needs for palliative care are identified rather late in the illness journey? Um, or are we doing a better job with veterans? Are we uh, providing them a palliative approach earlier than the average person because they're better resourced? I don't know. Yeah, I, um, I mean, the VA was among one of the first systems in the United States to institute palliative care um, at scale um, and to be uh, really proactive about it. So um, I, I think we don't have a lot of direct comparisons, um, you know, but, uh, but I think that there um, is evidence we provide very good care. And then the other thing I would say is that the, um, you know, the VA as a system at scale nationally, and we're talking about nearly 150 um, healthcare systems, local regional healthcare systems, you know, we monitor the quality of the care we provide. We institute something called the instituted something called the bereaved family survey in uh, over the last decade, um, which gives us um, really concrete and meaningful feedback about the care um, that veterans and their families are receiving during the last month or two of life. So, um, so we have have had both an emphasis and a set of tools to work with that have been fairly exceptional, unfortunately. Carl, um, I'm a palliative care physician as well, and I uh, work in people's homes. And uh, really, some of the impetus for Sienna and I, you know, working together on this, what we're calling this uh, gentle revolution, is really because we were, uh, quite frankly, alarmed and sick and tired of, um, you know, hearing people's stories where they, um, at the 11th hour of their illness, uh, progressive life-limiting illness, whether it's COPD, um, interstitial lung disease, heart failure, advanced cancer, Parkinson's, whatever, ALS, that most people didn't realize what they didn't get before the palliative care people walked through the door. Um, that they thought they were getting decent care but really, when you unpack what kind of care they got, they got um, care that was focused on the day-to-day -day trees of the illness, the um, potassium levels, the Lasix levels, the uh, fluid balance, the, um, you know, uh, the blood work, the tests. But they really had very little idea about the big picture of their illness. They had no idea where they were at in their illness, how things were going to unfold, what to expect, what to prepare for, all of that amplified their symptoms. And so, and when I hear about surveys that survey people in the last month or two, um, I wonder how much that reflects all the gaps in care that happened before those months. And do they even know what they didn't get or should have got? Yeah, um, it's a great question. I think it's why um, both in, in VA, but also in the healthcare system at large, we need what you would call both process measurement and outcome measurement, right? Um, because uh, we care very much about all that healthcare that's delivered in advance. And as you know, um, actually, we care about it well before any palliative care teams get involved. The average, or I wouldn't say the average, but many um, individuals, the majority, live with one to two years of profound disability, um, you know, two or more ADL difficulties, and so, um, which becomes strikingly common the closer we get to death, um, but that is uh, several years of real, uh, real difficulty for both caregivers and the individual, and so um, when we really think about good care uh, as we become frail, um, you're right, we have to think about it much earlier. And um, actually it incorporates collaboration and has to incorporate collaboration with our um, colleagues in geriatrics, um, with our colleagues in primary care, um, and with other uh, specialists, right, who are 
involved in surgery, who are involved in other types of disease focused or organ focused uh, specialties. And so um, you're right, it has to be earlier um, and uh, even much earlier, right, for many of those patients. Yeah, I mean, arguably, it should be at the time of the diagnosis of what we know in the healthcare yeah. business that these are progressive life limiting illnesses. They're not chronic, uh, they progress and they shorten life. Um, yeah. And we know which diagnoses uh, these are associated with. Um, you, you, mentioned, you mentioned something um, in your story at the beginning about um, something being common at the time you were an intern. This idea that you would get handed the baton when there was nothing more that your colleague could do for them. Um, I was curious about how you said it was common at the time because um, in our country, that uh, transfer of care model is still alive and I wouldn't say well, it's not well. Um, yeah. People are still saying things like, sorry, there's no more treatment for you. There's nothing we can do for you. You're palliative, they label them. They try to hand the baton to the death squad. Um, it's a big problem. It, it, is, it is a big problem. And um, I don't mean to imply that it doesn't still happen. I think. Um, I think many people understand it's not an acceptable way to talk about what we do, right? That there's always care to provide. It's just that the focus of that care may change. And, um, and no matter what kind of care we provide, um, it should be provided as caring, right? Not as treatment um, uh, alone, uh, not as just technically focused care. So, uh, you know, I, I, I would like to think that it, um, that it doesn't happen often. Yeah, but um, but I'm afraid it probably still does to a degree. Now, I one of the things I would would pick up on right that you mentioned, Sammy, is that um, you know the other the other thing about this journey being a long one is that most of it has nothing to do with us. I mean, us as healthcare providers, it has everything to do with the life that people live in their home and community. And you know, unfortunately, that's not easy to monetize, even even for the Canadian government. Right. Um, we just don't really have a way to think about that, about capturing the cost and value of better support in home and community. But um, uh, because the benefits aren't all accrued in the healthcare system, they're also accrued um, to the person whose life is better. Right. And to their family members. But um, but that is a really important thing to remember, I think, because uh Disease is a, an illness and incapacity are a 24 seven problem. Almost all of the consequences of illness until I'm close to the end have nothing to do with the healthcare system, right? It's the middle of the night fear, right? That I might have to go to the emergency room. It's the inability to quite get to the bathroom. It's um, the challenge that I have when I dribble food down the front of my shirt and someone has to clean it. Um, it's my inability to get out and spend time with my friends doing things that I've always enjoyed. Those are the impacts um, that we need to remember are, are in aggregate much more profound than the ones we see. You're so right. And the ripple effect on um, the person's family of choice, right? And the collateral uh, illness journey that happens for them, um, that's hard to monetize as well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You said something else that struck me about um, in the reasons why you ended up in palliative care. One of them was this um, terrible sense of helplessness that you had um, when you didn't feel you had the skills uh, to care. Um, you hadn't been trained in a way to um, prepare you for caring for the patients you mentioned makes me reflect on all the doctors and nurses who don't get palliative care training, that in Canada, it's not a mandatory part of our nursing and med school curriculum. So it's no wonder that our nursing and doctor colleagues that aren't in palliative care try to hand people over to us because uh, they feel helpless. They feel like a failure. And... Um, you know, we'll never have enough palliative care doctors to to take on all the people who require a palliative approach. And so how good 
is the training happening in the U.S. for nurses and doctors? Yeah, I mean, I think it's better than when I came along, right? Um, you know, I, I know that uh, our medical students, um, you know, get as much attention as we can lavish on them. Uh, you know, these days I have medical students and, and residents coming to us who are really interested in the topic and recognize it as an area that they can focus on um, building their um, capacity for. But, um, you know, again, I think uh, it's not a physician problem, right? It's a, it's a multidisciplinary problem. And because the problem is so great, not only do we need every physician to carry, you know, some of the burden, but we need to empower nurses and empower social workers um, and empower lay persons, right, to play an important role in, um, in achieving some of the goals that, um, that we have for, uh, for patients and families. I mean, um, there's a doctor named Manali Patel at, uh, at Stanford. She's an oncologist, and I really admire work that she's done um, conducting trials to uh, empower lay persons to play a role in advanced care planning, in monitoring symptoms and supporting patients and families at home when they're um, challenged by these transitional issues and their, and their illness. Um, so I think it's, uh, it is partly a professional challenge and we definitely need to strengthen the training uh, that's available at all stages, but it's also um, an issue of empowering communities and laypersons. I'm so glad you said that, Carl, because that was a big push for our podcast that um, we have both, Sammy and I have both done lots of research on educating clinicians and uh, home care providers on palliative care, but recognizing the needle wasn't moving fast enough. And the, the opportunity to provide this information and this, I guess, training or these, this awareness to patients and families so that they could also be the initiators of these conversations. It wasn't necessarily to initiate palliative care care earlier, but it was to start a palliative care approach and to allow them the uh, permission to ask questions about, like you said, the things that are going to be important to them much earlier on. So a big thing in the waiting room revolution is to use metaphors and plain language to break down the barriers to having a conversation. And I'm wondering if you have any comment or good ideas of how to get this information earlier in the trajectory to your own patients. Um, I'm, I'm not sure that I have um, any great ideas, but one I've been playing with the last year or so, you know, something that's intrigued me is the idea that by the time we get to midlife, that almost all of us have experienced significant losses. And I, I've, uh, in, in my work, uh, which I still do in primary care, one of the things I've toyed with the residents is asking patients for stories about the losses they've experienced in life. And approaching advanced care planning um, and goals of care communication through the back door of lived experience. And I think that that is um, something that I'm, I'm hoping to do a little bit more with. I, I feel like um, we don't ask enough um, for patients' own stories. And when we have formal goals of care conversations, you know, it's remarkable how often something will turn up from somebody about, well, my friend, so and so, well, my mother, or well, my father. And, and, and how people tend to draw on those stories anyway, even though we often don't access them proactively. So um, I, I think, um, sadly, uh, loss is so common by midlife that for me, that's a great place to start. Um, and so uh, not everybody has such a story. I've also found that out or not any, any, everyone has drawn lessons from a story, but, um, but it's often a place to connect. And it's often a place people can relate to. Take that as a clinical pearl. <laughs> Following up on what Carl was saying about how, you know, most people's care happens outside of the interface with formal health care system, for sure. Um, and that, that's exactly what our podcast aimed to do, which is really to um, activate patients and families to learn these skills and mindsets so that when they come to the healthcare system at any point, that without it being left to chance, the right nurse, the right doctor, um, the comfort or the skill of the social worker, the doctor, the nurse, the OT, the PT, whoever, that they would have these um, skills and mindsets 
so that they could leach out of their experience within the healthcare system and in their own private lives, uh, create a palliative approach for themselves. But we didn't really ever label it a palliative approach. We just taught the skills and the mindset because Sienna and I go back and forth about the P word, you know, <laughs> do we raise awareness about the P word so that, you know, um, people accept it? Or do we say, let's just talk about what we really mean and not have to label it. Um, but in this podcast series, it's rather late in the episodes nearing the end that we talk about what is palliative care and so on and so forth. But yeah, um, patients we feared were just floating in an abyss, um, not really with any anchors or roadmap with their illness. And that, as you know, amplifies their suffering and symptoms um, to the point where we come in and we have to untangle all of it. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, you know, I think it's interesting what you raise and, um, and language does matter. And, you know, honestly, um, there are advantages and disadvantages to being seen as a specialty, right? Yeah. We're an area of special expertise, but on the other hand, we're subject to the same siloing problems that the rest of the healthcare system has, um, both because of our own behaviors and because, uh, you know, we've kind of bought into that model. Um, I, I remember um, talking to a, uh, a cardiologist at a, at a premier institution in the United States, and you know, I remember her telling me that at, at her facility, um, they would partner with the palliative care team, and they called themselves the cardiology support team. And I think that that's um, a really nice model of how to present ourselves. You know, I I don't think we need to be cardiologists or palliative care providers. Um, we need to be a support team for both the disease and its consequences, right? By integrating um, together with, um, you know, with our, our specialist colleagues and, and primary care um, colleagues. And so I don't, um, I think language does matter here, but, but you're right. Instead of trying to educate people about palliative care, it's, it's, more, um, it's more helping them realize that we have ways to um, to identify and meet the needs that they have and to present ourselves in partnership. Um, because what we're trying not to do um, is take away possibilities insofar as they exist, um, but rather to augment them, right? To give them a range of, of uh, perhaps more meaningful opportunities for their care. So, you know, there's all these models where we take these uber specialists, you know, the cardiologist, the respirologist, the organ specialists, and we say, okay, well, the answer really is integrating palliative care specialists. And so they work together as a support team. And I see where there's value, but this is, this is the provocative part. I, you know, part of me really does wonder why such a smartologist, a cardiologist can do everything that he or she or they can do. But really, we can't infuse into their training how to take their patients right to the end. You know, many of my colleagues say the only people that can provide Cadillac palliative care are palliative care specialists. And so everyone should be referred to us. I'm like, really? Let's break this specialty down. Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. And I, I think that um, uh, it's not easy to answer. You know, um, there are, I think, examples of care that are provided where um, it's definitely helpful to have a specialist, you know, and more technical um, sorts of care, extremely complicated care, that's probably true. Um, you know, in, uh, in some of these, in some other domains like communication, right, which um, clearly is not, uh, which is very interpersonal, I think it is really important, for example, for that, uh, that primary provider, whether that person is more of a specialist or actually a generalist, um, to be involved, right? Uh, partly because of relational continuity. Um, and you're right, also because, um, because I think that um, the care that they provide um, and the outcomes for their patients may be diminished by the you know, neglect of that. So, uh, but at the end of the day, it's the patient and the holistic view of it all that we care about most. I think we don't know very much about exactly where these dividing lines should fall. 
And above all, to be successful, they have to be embraced, right? And so it's really working with stakeholders to understand how you're going to shoulder the work for overall care. And it's about creating structures and rewards in the healthcare system that reward how we function as teams instead of as individuals. Because no matter who winds up doing it, the bottom line is at the end of the day, you want the right problems to be identified and you want patients to have the right opportunities for the right kind of care. And so um, I think there may be many ways to, uh, to address that problem, but we have yet to, to really sort it out, I think, in, um, in definitive ways. Uh, Carl, maybe you can spend the next couple of decades doing that. <laughs> uh, well, um, from the gray hair on my head, you, um, you might uh, perceive that that would be a challenge. <laughs> <laughs> so, Carl, you mentioned some of these domains like communication. These are interpersonal and could and should be done not only by palliative care specialists, right? Every provider has a role in that. And I'm curious to know your thoughts about some of the momentum that is building around communication skills training, particularly around serious illness. On one hand, a structured conversation, um, like using a script, can really help people uh, who want that guidance. And then on the other hand, it might give the idea that it's like cookbook medicine or that it's physician or system driven rather than patient driven because patients might have things they want to bring up that don't fall into this script. So I'm curious, what are your thoughts on these interventions using very structured communication training? So um, what I would say about that is, um, thank goodness people are using them, <laughs> you know, for one. Um, and secondly, I remember when I started out and I took Epic and one of the first things that I did you know, way back in the day, because um, that was really the only training uh, modality available to me at the time. But I remember I, I cut out of Epic, like a, this page with all the um, phrases that you could use to start such a conversation. Um, and I carried it around with me in my pocket until I had internalized them. So I think it's a little bit like training wheels, you know, um, the more important thing is to regard it as part of your job. And, you know, when we enter clinical practice, whether it is caring for patients post MI, whether it's managing hypertension or whether it's having a, a good goals of care conversation, I think we, right after training, we have not um, acquired the full range of skills that it requires to do those things, right? What we need to be is to be socialized into recognizing it as an important part of our work. And we need to be given the tools to begin. So for me, the scripts are the tools to begin. And the fact that we try to begin is a fact is reflective of the fact that we regard it as important um, in our work. And so um, I don't have a problem with it. I agree with you. Um, it's uh, it's something ultimately that has to be internalized, right? Those questions have to become our own. And um, after we get some experience with them, we find out that there are subtle ways to use and not use them. Um, but uh, but I'm not at all offended by um, beginning with a script. I'm just thankful if anybody even makes the effort, because far too often the problem has been no one's had this conversation whatsoever. Yeah, you, you make a good point. Um, we did uh, some research around uh, this here and found that we could teach people with these scripts and they would be more comfortable and confident, um, you know, having serious illness conversations. Uh, but, you know, when they went back into practice, they um, had trouble identifying when to um, bring forward these conversations. They were missing, they, they could learn uh, in theory what the triggers are, but in real life practice, they were still not picking up on the when to have them. So, so you're saying they didn't go beyond the script? Is that, is that kind no, of what, what I'm saying is that they could, they could learn the script they oh, could I practice the script uh -huh. on a standardized patient. Yeah. They would um, report that they felt more comfortable and confident uh -huh. yeah. and ready to go. So okay. they would go back into their um, clinical practice uh -huh. and they were asked to identify patients and have these conversations. And they fell short on identifying opportunities and appropriate times to uh, introduce the serious illness conversations. Well, you know, that, that gets back to the fact that um, there are many more um, issues, right, other than language that uh, affect our ability to implement communication effectively, right? I think more and more health systems are actually using 
um, formal triggers of risk, right? Um, things like predictive models or analytics, right? That, that give us a better sense as clinicians of the, of, uh, the prognostic risk that any individual may face um, uh, in the way that we're triggered to give a pneumovax, say for a patient over 65. And I, I think also um, clinicians have to understand that it's part of their job and they have to be rewarded um, for having those conversations. They have to be given the time to have those conversations. Um, often they need additional assistance to set them up, right, to involve family members. So, so the communication, uh, the words, right, the actual act of speaking is actually a, a relatively small part of that whole complex act of communication for which there are a range of barriers and facilitators we have, we have to address. So it can't be up to the clinician. The clinician is a necessary but, but, um, but ultimately insufficient um, you know, actor for ensuring that it occurs. We have to have healthcare administrators, um, healthcare managers, um, policy makers also endorse the importance of this to make it a sufficient priority. I love I love listening to you because um, you're so systems minded. You actually take me out of the weeds of the issues and and uh, and do what we tell people do, which is to see the bigger picture. Right? It's not we can't just reduce these complex challenges to um, the things I'm asking you about. <laughs> so thank you for reminding us about how important that that, that um, you know overarching view is. Sure. Well, they, it, it certainly starts with the individual clinician, um, but like all things in healthcare, it can't end there. Yeah. Carl, when we when we started, you you mentioned um, you know losing your father in November. I'm not even sure how to introduce that because, um, but I, and if if you still want to talk about that, but you know, has there been you know personal experiences you know in the past year with palliative care? Um, with my dad. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, I think you can introduce that the way you introduce anything, right? I mean, loss is something that all of us suffer. It's a universal experience. Um, it's not going away. Ignoring it doesn't make it different. Um, you know, and, and it, the loss in my case is, has been, uh, you know, some months, quite a few months. And, um, Yes, I could. Uh, I could be quite emotional about it, but I also um, it is also an important thing to talk about. So, no, thank you for asking. Um, my dad didn't have access to palliative care, and actually, something that I really should write about is I, you know, um, my father was a very pragmatic man. He started life as a farmer, and then he wound up, you know, um, being a mortgage banker later in life, but. Um, but he started out as a farmer and had a very pragmatic Midwestern approach to, um, to his life. He and my mother always planned ahead. Um, during, he, he had access to uh, care. He had long-term care insurance with his dementia. And as his ADL started to fail, he, um, he made uh, use of that. But one of the things that, um, that is true is that the salaries that are paid to long-term, to workers in um, in home care are so low that even with the resources he supposedly had, it was very difficult for him and my mother to secure care. Um, fortunately, um, he had additional support. He was also a veteran. And so he had home-based primary care um, before it was more widely available. Um, that was also really important in allowing him to remain at home um, for another year or two that he otherwise probably would have been institutionalized. And then when things went um, really south for him because of the social isolation that resulted in a real crash in his cognitive abilities. And, um, and you know, even my mother with her unbelievably dedicated care couldn't manage. Um, he went into assisted living. And one of the most difficult things for my, my sister and I was that uh, there was nothing really to be had no way to understand the quality or circumstances in assisted living and what that would be like. It was a very difficult and disappointing experience. Um, and my father, um, because of the change in his care environment, um, he actually went downhill even more rapidly over the subsequent six or eight weeks. Um, when he was when he was uh, when he was then hospitalized because. 
Um, you know, we were concerned that really it was sort of a volume problem that he wasn't eating enough. And so he did go to the emergency room um, one last time. And um, that turned out not to be the case, but I'll never forget. And I won't say the name of the hospital um, where he went, but there would be one that um, that would be, uh, you know, many people might be aware of and go, aha. But he went to a hospital and, uh, you know, we we tried our best because it was COVID to communicate with the care team, um, had a conversation with somebody about um, his approach to care and kind of how we would like um, to um, set him up for um, hospice subsequently in his discharge. And then an hour or two later, um, we received a call from the hospital saying he'll be dropped off. He'll be dropped off in approximately one hour at the following address. And I remember um, going ballistic um, because without any conversation with the family, this hospital had devised a discharge plan um, not involving hospice um, and basically dumping my father on the street again. Um, and at that point, I kind of took off the mask. Um, I, used, uh, I used the fact that I'm a physician, right, to um, really just to let them know that I understood that things didn't have to be that way, and I expected them not to be that way. But I think for many families who don't have, and my sister also is a, a senior nurse in a pretty significant healthcare system in the area. So um, without the kind of uh, family knowledge and um, ability that we have to manage that situation, um, it would have been disastrous. So I have to say, um, it was quite distressing because I can't imagine how many other individuals were, were managed in a similar fashion there. Oh man, Carl, that's awful. I'm so sorry to hear that. You know, this is one of the reasons for the waiting room revolution, for all those patients and families who don't have a doctor in the family or don't have a Sammy or a Carl in their phones, you know, to call for help. We were trying to teach them ways so that they could take charge of their situation and be better advocates. Sorry, please continue your story. So after you got involved, was it better for your dad? Um, but, you know, we were able to take, um, to take some control uh, of my dad's care and to get him discharged then to delay this sort of precipitous plan for getting him out of hospital um, to actually then arrange for him to have an actual transition into a hospice home. And so he was really fortunate. So he died there. Though my sister did say when she was allowed to visit him because that she and my mother were finally allowed to see him on the end of the second day that he was in hospital. And she said she went to see him and he had a cherry red dry mouth because he wasn't being provided with oral care. And um, so, you know, I, I think this goes back to kind of what Sammy was saying. Are things really any better? Well, I think they are, but boy, we still have a long way to go. And that personal experience with my dad reminds me of it. I'm really grateful that his decline was fast in some ways um, because he didn't have to suffer greatly, um, although it was a terrible loss. It's a horrible story. I was just going to make a comment about um, um, Carl's father's story, just that if COVID did one thing, it really did I hope shine a spotlight on all the informal caregivers who would have normally been by their loved one's sides in the hospitals or the long-term care facilities or assisted living or wherever, that um, they are truly unsung heroes. They were doing all so much of the um, personal and uh, care. And when we took them out of the equation because of infection uh, risk, uh, Nelves got dry, people got dehydrated. Um, you know, so your dad's story reminds me uh, that his mouth wouldn't have been that way um, had the family been by his bedside. Yeah. Carl, um, you know, we, we, this whole podcast started with sort of, um, you know, people coming to us and saying, I wish I'd known that sooner. I wish I'd known about palliative care sooner. And so it's about, you know, advice. Uh, trying to go upstream. And so from all your experiences, I mean, what advice do you have for patients and families starting a journey with facing serious illness? Yeah, I mean, it's, um, 
I, I think it's um, really helpful to be prepared. And there are some wonderful resources out there that I know um, some patients I've encountered have used. Um, some of it's just general knowledge, um, something like when breath becomes air or um, being mortal. Um, I think, you know, then there have been other, you know, books that have been written around the complexity of really managing things. And, um, and so I think you can go deeper um, uh, right in, into understanding issues around long-term care insurance, et cetera, et cetera. You know, I, I mean, I, I think that in primary care, one of the real issues is that, um, you know, if you wait too late, you can't do anything about it because of the financial cost involved. And so for people who have the financial means, you actually have to start planning in your 40s. You know, I don't understand why in um, general internal medicine and primary care, we haven't made assessment of caregiving circumstances and um, financial preparation for end of life um, a standard issue for individuals in their 40s, right? Preferably in their early 40s. And so, um, you know, I think that's one answer. Uh, yes, we can direct people to resources, but by the time we're thinking of it, it's honestly often too late. Um, and this is true about retirement in general, which is why you know, we have these default plans that are opt out instead of opt in. And the same needs to be true about the way we as clinicians care for patients and families who are facing these issues. So um, I think one lesson is to start much earlier in helping people understand the kinds of things that are necessary to have adequate care. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, that implies that we're going to have changes too and the kind of supports that we provide in the healthcare system um, and changes in the way that we live in communities. So. Um, I, you know, I, I think uh, um, there are innovative ways, you know, that people, that aging is forcing um, probably Canadians as well as Americans to to, to live, um, one being intentional community. Um, you know, that's an example of something that, that someone might consider when they don't have children and family to fill the gap for them. You know, I, I think we have to start with education, but we have to start it much earlier. <laughs> And a high dose of mortality awareness. And a high dose of mortality awareness, undoubtedly. Yeah. Carl, thank you so much for joining us today. We really appreciate your time. Yes. Um, I really enjoyed uh, talking with all of you. And um, thanks uh, for what you're doing. Thanks for listening. Please visit our website, WaitingRoomRevolution.com, to listen to our first season about the seven keys and to learn more. The podcast is produced and edited by me and Kayla McMillan. Our theme music is made pole by Ketza. Please rate, review, and subscribe to our podcast and help us get the word out.